Mm, welcome to our, another of our Wednesday Yachting Luncheons. It's beautiful out these windows at the St. Francis Yacht Club, and it's wonderful to have all of you here. So, you know, we belong to airlines where we have frequent flyer miles, and if you stay at certain hotels, you get to have some kind of frequent flyer respect. But at our Yacht Club, we have something kind of similar. That is to say, if you come to enough Wednesday Yachting Luncheons, and then you leave us, we're going to remember you. And such is the case with our dear friend, who usually sits in the table with the black tablecloth right now. Thank you, Joy, for pointing. That has been the table of John and Mary Cumberpatch, and he joined in 19, hold it, 51. And he passed away after, last Thursday, six days ago today, and uh, he was an incredible starboat sailor member of our Yacht Club, wonderful husband for all these years, supported by the wonderful Mary, who is invited to always come back and join us, even though she's in deep sorrow right now at the passing of her lovely husband. They were both in their 90s, and John and Mary are um, missed today, and we'll miss John um, forever. He's a great guy, and we loved him a bunch, so that's why that black tablecloth is there. So I'd like us all to just to think for a moment, take a little... Uh, a little silence and think about the very first time you went sailing and think about marrying a lady 60 years ago and think about the incredible number of fun people you've met and wonderful times you've had by being part of our yacht club because that's the story of John Cumberpatch starboat sailor longtime member same woman all these years and a great great guy so when I just get a hand, little hand for John Cumberpatch. John, we miss you. And, um, you know, all of us at one point are going to go out the gate and maybe cop a left, maybe go straight, maybe cop a right, but not come back. And um, we, we will be thinking about you for a long time. Let's see. A little bit about future speakers. Now, as you've been seeing on the screen, we put up the future speakers for the people in the room to see, but I'll mention it for the folks who are online. And we, by the way, we now have the viewers in New Zealand and viewers in Germany and Brazil. Those are like top three countries where we have viewers. And we're over a quarter million views now of our uh, online archive of programs, so that's kind of wonderful. Let's see, at the end of the year, you probably have heard of the um, boys, the San Francisco Boys Chorus. They won uh, a Grammy, and they'll be here on December 18th for the traditional father-son Christmas luncheon. On December the 11th, John G. O'Hagan will be here. The author wrote a book about Japan's secret submarine war plan and the plan to attack the west coast of california we heard about it we heard about the nets but he's actually uncovered incredible research and wrote a whole book about it so there really was there really were submarines going up and down the coast st francis yacht club had a whole uh, uh crew and fleet of yachts that were patrolling who lord knows what they would have done if they'd seen a submarine but they were out there tom conroy and the boys used to tell me about it when i was a kid here um, and then on december the 4th Come by to hear the great, great naturalist Michael Ellis. He'll be here to talk all about Mysteries of the Mojave, one-time lake, now the driest, hottest desert in North America. Um, on the 20th of November, uh, the guy who invented the trim tab, Dick Carter, the yacht designer uh, and two-time Fastnet winner, winner, will be here to talk all about um, his life as a yacht designer. I love old maps, antique maps, and prints, and one of the masters of that, such collections is Jimmy Shine. He'll be here. He's the owner and shopkeeper of Shine and Shine Antique Books and Prints. He'll be here November 13th. He'll show us the original charts of San Francisco Bay. We know that San Francisco's waterline has changed because, you know, 150 years ago, how could you get more land in San Francisco? The answer is you bought water rights and then you tore down a hill and shoved it into the water. It's exactly how Mission Bay was filled in. And he'll talk all about how the waterfront were on change. Many of you, how many of you been in the mob? How many of you been mistresses or had a mistress when you had your mob connection? Okay, so I'm not sure this will be relevant, but 
Barbara Roberts was an MD and mob doctor and mistress. And of course, they all come back with the tell-all books. She's got hers. So she'll be here to talk all about it. I asked the question, which matters most, the Hippocratic Oath or the Juror's Oath? You get to decide after listening to her. And she'll be here to make her case. Um, and then on, uh, on October the 30th, we'll get to hear all about the new museum that is um, that's happening in Treasure Island. And um, you say, Treasure Island has a museum? I forgot there was a Treasure Island. <laughs> well, well, there is a Treasure Island, and it has its own museum. You get to hear all about it by a couple of members of the board who will talk all about their fun and exciting plans. Um, now, a little bit about our speaker today. So it's always interesting how people get started in sailing and when. Our speaker today literally cannot remember a time before he was sailing. He basically thinks at birth he was sailing with his family on their little sea snark. Who sailed on a sea snark? I have. Sea snarks, there we go. Of course, Paul, our resident naval architect. Every yachting lunch, you must have a naval architect. Paul is ours. And of course, he sailed in a sea snark. I have two. There are 10 foot Latine cat boats. Okay, you can buy a styrofoam version for $199 if you splurge. Uh, well, that was one of those kind of boats that our speaker started sailing on. And by the time he was 10, he'd moved up to a turnabout, which is also 10 feet, but a little bit more stable. Um, you could ask, how many people can you get on a sea snark? John will answer that question a little bit. At 15, he was uh, you know, advanced up to the 420 land. And uh, by 18, like many of us, he was teaching sailing. And uh, you know, in, in his hometown in Maine, he got to be quite a good sailor. Took a year off at 19, as many of us did, to go sailing. And he sailed around you know, in a small boat down to Venezuela. And uh, I don't think it was a drug run at all. And anybody who says so, Show me your evidence. Uh, he graduated to the Maxi Circuit, you know, in his middle 20s, raced against uh, Kealoa and Boomerang and all those cool kind of a boats. Came back to the, came to the Bay Area in 84, started selling um, um, clothing in the marine industry. Who has had a tough sleigh ride before? <laughs> Anybody who tries to do that can tell you that's not real easy. Then he graduated to be in publishing. Now that's an easy path. <laughs> publishing, that's working out really well for most people. But in fact, as now the publisher of Latitude 38, they have carved out an incredible niche because their little, you know, newsprint publication has more authority than I would argue pretty much any other nautical publication. And I'm talking about the seahorses of the world and other very fancy, you know, glossy versions of the nautical rag industry. And Latitude 38 is quite a significant uh, publication uh, in our view. And uh, who could tell us more about it than the publisher himself, John Arndt. Come on up, John Arndt. Well, thank you, Ron. And, uh, you know, I like to uh, say I get a lot of sailing in the bay, but I think the only guy that gets more sailing than anybody I know is Ron Young. Uh, I race against him Friday nights at the Corinthian Yacht Club, uh, and any other time I get into a race, Ron's there. And so, uh, and of course, uh, being a, a long-time, lifelong sailor, um, and it's got stuck in my blood and my <clears throat> DNA since the early days, um, and I always love people who love to sail. And uh, so, so um, I also just to say I, I did make this talk maybe a little longer than uh, my, I'm scheduled here for, so I might go through this a little quickly, um, so that we because we're going to do a Q and A after. So um, I, I will not just sort of elaborate so much in all these little slides and, and tales I might might have, but I will uh, will we'll carry forth. But I want to tell you a little bit just about sailing latitudes history, some of the challenges we face in the sailing community world that's changed since. I started way back when, and then, of course, some of the things we're covering at Latitude and some of the new um, things, I think, and hopeful things for the future of sailing. So there's me. That's, that's uh, starting out in my little boat, our sea snark. When I was about 10 years old, that's me in the blue turtleneck with two brothers, you know, three of us with no life jackets, one little brother with two. Um, and... Uh, yeah, yeah. Now, we probably had more than that but uh, at, at times, but that was a little styrofoam boat that got hundreds of thousands of people sailing probably in the 70s. And um, 
you know, this was always great fun for the family. We did a, we did a ton of sailing this boat. And actually, I, I was going to say, too, this is, I think, where the passion for sailing comes from. I'm sure most people here started in something that was little rub-a-dub-dub-tub around somewhere. And um, somehow, all these years later, we're still doing it and loving it. Um, and the other evening, I'm going to mention uh, Tom Siebel was here. He's donated money to youth sailing. And I asked him how he got started sailing. And it was a sunfish up in Lake Michigan. Uh, same kind of passion he carries forth. You know, I and a snark, he and a sunfish, our lives diverged a little bit from there. But we still have that same passion for sailing. And I, that's one of the great things about sailing. I think that sticks with you your whole life. Um, so then um, Latitude 38. I did a lot of sailing um, as Ron outlined, all through my youth. Um, never got far from the water, came to California, and of course, being a Maine sailor, one of those New Englanders who had that sailing season, you know, July 31st or July 30th till August 1st, and then we put the boats away. Um, it was pretty amazing to come out here uh, and find a 12-month sailing season. It was uh, really spectacular. And, uh, you know, in fact, uh, I think actually, I can remember when I was calling, uh, I got here, didn't have a job. I had a friend who had a room open, said try California for a little while. I thought I'd come for a couple of years. I got a temporary job making phone calls at night selling opera tickets, phone banking. <laughs> One of my first calls was Grant Settlemeyer. And, <laughs> and I got talking sailing. And uh, next thing in, <laughs> next thing I know, I was racing Wednesday nights here on, on, NAR, on the Canar fleet. So, that's one of the first sailing connections I made selling opera tickets here in San Francisco. But anyway, they, um, we, uh, I guess, want to just sort of launch into some of the fun things we do here at Latitude 38, and that is cover sailing on San Francisco Bay. And, uh, you know, it, about an hour ago, you couldn't have sailed anywhere, but as always, the breeze is coming up right now. California itself is a spectacular place to sail. The bay is an amazing place to sail. And whatever you've uh, got to get on the bay, whether it's a snark, a sunfish, or uh, any other a vessel, uh, the bay is one of the most rewarding and most fun, most challenging places to sail anywhere. And of course, um, for, for uh, Latitude 38, it's begin, what a, what a franchise, what a place to start a sailing magazine. And um, you know, one of the things I just talked, sort of the early days of sailing, the, when I got here, was 1987. The magazine started in 77. And in 77, you think about that, that's like 32 years after the end of World War II. And the baby boomers were 32 years old. Um, you know, they were, and that's when sailing was rocking. 1977, Merlin was launched and set the Transpac record. Costa Mesa was, I, I, somebody told me the other day, 250 boat builders in Costa Mesa in 1977. I mean, they were spitting out boats uh, down there, Islanders, Catalinas, Rangers, which is what I have, a Ranger 33, um, Coronados, Columbias. Uh, then there was Hobie Cats just flying out and windsurfing was coming along. J24 was launched. The windsurfing was coming alive. Uh, 1977 was a fortuitous time to start a sailing magazine. And of course, uh, there was the right guy for the job, Richard Spindler, who um, did an amazing job starting it on a boat uh, with his wife, Kathy, in Sausalito, but uh, had an amazing talent for writing and fun and uh, provocateur. Just uh, for me, he was... Um, a great mentor for publishing, although I found out after all these years of selling ads and jumping into a publisher seat, there's a lot to learn about editorial. That uh, uh, I, so I'm still learning a lot about that. But it was um, it was a ton of fun, and he's a really um, been amazing uh, guy to lead Latitude 38 and to create the institution he did. And of course, all the surrounding things, the baha ha ha, um, and I think you know his his great love is sharing the fun of sailing. Um, and of course, sailing's fun to start with, but he uh, had a way of just writing about it, making it all that much more fun. A um, couple other pictures here, too, just uh, the covers. You know, you think about what you get to cover here in San Francisco Bay. If we were on the Chesapeake, we were in Seattle, if we were in Maine, you would just never get this kind of action and fun and excitement that you get right here in San Francisco Bay. It's a spectacular place to sail. You know, here's, uh, of course, Larry Ellison and, and uh, the, what was this, 2013 America's Cup, um, and, or no, 2007, I think that was, and then that woman's leaving last year on the Baja Haha ha, um, from San Diego. Um, we love, this is this year's Transpac, which had a fin finish line there with that big sun behind it, and the Delta, the Delta Ditch Run. Um, this, this 
sort of world of sailing, as we say, covering the world of sailing through the eyes of the West Coast sailor, um, that's a lot of sailing. It seems like a small market, but there's a ton going on. Then, uh, of course, uh, since the days of bloopers and IOR boats and pinched transoms and all that stuff, when DeWitt Sales was advertising in uh, Latitude 38 in those early days, right, Jim? Thank you very much, helping keep us all here. Um, but things have changed since those early days in 77, and, and uh, this is high dropped air, of course, the, um, the uh, America's Cup boats. We just had Sail GP here this summer, and um, what, a, what a world it's turned into. I mean, just the transformation in technology um, has changed a lot of sailing, and it's created even more pathways. I mean, I think when I was young, again, 1977, West Sail the World, you could go off and do that. America, though, was also winning Olympic medals. The um, Whitbread Round the World race, race was taking off IOR 80s. Um, now there's kiteboarding uh, out here, racing at the St. Francis, and this kind of stuff going on here. You know, here's Chip Wasson at the start of the Ron Stan Bridge to Bridge, um, just hanging around, waiting for the starting gun. Um, but you know, this is the kind of stuff that we get to cover when we're covering sailing in San Francisco Bay, and it's. Uh, Let's see, my voice, is that too loud if I'm that close? Or that's good, okay. Um, and then, you know, the thing we come back to and the thing I like to get pictures, these are a couple of my favorite covers, you know, for all this excitement and technology and energy and the racing that comes around is the pure fun that family, kids, and all of us get. And again, starting in that sea snark for me was a great start. It's lasted and uh, it surely will last uh, forever here with me. But this kind of laughter, fun, and family activity to me is the core of what gets so many people started. And you love that kind of picture. I love that kind of um, image that sailing presents there. But, okay, so since 1977, I'm going to shift gears here a little bit and um, shift into a little sort of demographics change. What's happened in sailing since then? We know there's been some big declines in participation, uh, race fleets, other things. And so there's sort of some uh, industry numbers and things I'll share with you here that um, sort of are impacting the sport. And we wrote in our 500th issue in February, Evolution of the Bay Area. I got a few pictures I'll show you there. But here's just some interesting things. Uh, participation in 1979, start, magazine started in 77. 79 was the peak year of U.S. manufacturing, peak year of U.S. sailing participation, about 12 million people. Now we're about 3 million today. Um, boat building, we had 100,000. That included all those sea snarks. I mean, lots of styrofoam boats, you know, right down the line from the igloo cooler. Um, and uh, the... Uh, but boat building is about 5,000 boats now, and uh, so it's, it's really declined. But, of course, we know there's no shortage of boats, and, of course, U.S. population has increased. But another thing that's interesting that's happening, you know, we always tell people that sailing is an everyman sport. There's lots of, uh, you can get into little boats, you can do community sailing. But what's happened, I, I feel like it's a lot like Detroit. Um, you know, Detroit makes its money selling SUVs and big pickup trucks and all the little cars. They struggle to make a profit, and, and the sailing industry is largely the same. You look at a, a magazine now, go to a boat show, you see these kinds of boats promoted, and this is kind of how sailing is presented to a lot of the world. Very big boats, very luxurious boats, and two or one or two people on them, kind of nobody sailing. And that's a big difference from the 70s when sailing was promoted as a family activity. Here, of course, is the other kind of luxury that we had in the 70s, um, and you might recognize the guy there in that little Cal 20, Paul Kaplan, with his family, and he's got one, two, three, four, five, uh, six people in a Cal 20, and that's a Columbia 22, and you may remember um, 22 foot, a Ranger 23, when I was in my sea snark and turnabout, a Ranger 23 was my dream boat. Um, you know, I just hoped someday I would own a Ranger 23 and I could go cruising the world and that would, that would be fabulous. And you see this Columbia 22. This is when 22, 24 foot boats, J24, they were um, they were advertised with interiors, cushions, porta potties, a little stove in there, and people would go cruising on their you know Columbia 22 or their uh, Cal Catalina 22, and that was a family activity. Um, and that's when we had the luxury in that era of free time. You know, now we have luxury boats, but we don't have the luxury of free time to use them. And that's one of the big big changes in the world. You know, another thing that's sort of gotten a little bit challenging for sailing in general, in the 70s, you could just take a boat down to the shore, push it in the water, pretty much anywhere. Hobie Cat, uh, the world was 
a lot less densely packed, a lot fewer people, and so the, the shoreline was much more open to be utilized. And of course now we have the BCDC who's charged with providing access to the bay, and here's their fence that um, prevents you from getting to the bay and their signage saying don't you know touch the rocks don't get on the bay and the bcdc is doing a great job of creating bike paths around the bay but they're not actually providing access to the bay and i think this is one of the things that the BC bcdc has lost sight of and also made it challenging to get into the water and use small boats um, and not the way it was in those good old days and so this this is actually a picture of the kind of bay trails we'd love to have the BCDC working on, and of course Department of Boating and Waterways does, is launch ramps here to allow people to get boats in and out of the water. So we think all bay trails should be perpendicular to the water's edge, not along it. So, um, and here's another factor. Here's interesting, here's 750 slip marina in Alameda, Marina Village, beautiful marina filled with beautiful boats. They have a waterfront deli. Most marinas have a, a deli or a yacht club uh, associated with them, and yet it's closed on the weekends. And, of course, 30 years ago, that wouldn't have made sense because you go down to the marina on the weekend, it would be packed with sailors, families. You send your kids up, they'd get a popsicle or a bag of chips or a Coke. But now um, you go to the marina on the weekend, it's pretty quiet, and the marinas, can, uh, the delis at the marinas hardly have a, uh, a reason to be there. They just can't justify opening because the activity at the marinas are quiet. There's loads of boats there, but ask a harbor master how often they go out, and they'll say, oh, zero. I mean, tongue in cheek. 10 to 20 percent, though, go out with any regularity, and it's it's a real shame uh, because there's some beautiful boats out there. Flicking back in time, this is Lake Merritt. Again, small boats, and what participation was built using these kinds of boats? What do we got? El Toros, Blue Jays, Melody Snipes, Zephyrs, uh, Coast 13s, I haven't heard of those, and Penguin. We actually have a penguin in the family in Maine still that my grandfather bought my aunt in 19, I don't know, 48 or something like that. We still haven't have that boat. Um, so there's, you know, loads of people got into sailing um, in this kind of venue. You can still rent a boat in Lake Merritt for $10 an hour, so it is, uh, it's a pretty great place to go. And here's another marketing issue, I think, for sailing, though. Here's another thing where I think sailing or, or uh, the industry's lost the plot. You know, if you remember going to Sea Scouts or Boy Scouts and getting a compass and looking, there's the North Star, you know, there's the Big Dipper, and now we've got them advertising that you can see the stars in HDTV. You know, I mean, I know we're all sitting here with this incredible view out of the bay and we're watching monitors, but you know, this is, this is the crazy world we live in, is that we're spending a lot of time looking at screens when, you know, you step outside and you can see uh, the na nature, natural world and sailing in the bay, what got us in love with it all in the first place. Another little bay impact here, uh, development. Of course, um, we know there's a lot, of, there's a serious housing shortage up and down California, a lot of homeless problems. There needs to be housing built. But does housing need to be built to wall off the bay? Um, to me, it's, uh, it's a real challenge. Uh, a lot of these um, developments, which you can see um, in the shadows there, there's a lot of imagery of sailboats next to these beautiful condo projects. And the sailboats are beautiful decorations to the waterfront lifestyle these condos are selling. But we're kind of of the opinion that if you put a sailboat in your brochures and your renderings, that you should also put in boating facilities. That should be a law, you know, um, because if you're displacing, uh, you know, waterfront access with your condo development and therefore displacing the lifestyle that you're purporting to uh, to ask people to participate in, you're really not being helpful. I mean, we're really getting diminished access to the water and we do need the housing. You know, we can just set it back a half a mile and leave the shore for sailors and, and bike, bikers too. We're not, you know, we love those bike paths too. But I think, uh, I think that access, this is a real, a real challenge for the Bay Area and everywhere. We need the housing. Um, short walk in Sausalito, it's a no parking zone on land and with a dinghy. If you anchor in Richardson Bay, it's very hard to find a place to take your little Zodiac in. If you come down from the Pacific Northwest and cruise through the bay and want to anchor in this beautiful place we have, but then go ashore and get um, milk and eggs or beer and chips, um, it's really hard to find a place to go. And I think this is another challenge the Bay Area faces um, more than many. We don't have the public docks. We've got loads of boats, but not a lot of places to go, unless you're lucky enough to be in a yacht club and have reciprocal privileges. So. I always struggle with that word, reciprocal. All right. Um, here's another uh, little infrastructure issue. Um, 
you know, welcome to San Francisco. This is Pier 40. I uh, used to have a launch ramp down there that you could park, and mega yachts would park here, and, and boats would drop off passengers, charter boats. Oh, is that my warning signal? Um, so I'm going to I'm gonna speed this up even a little further. But I think, again, uh, access to um, the city and being able to use a boat and take it places is very difficult. Um, the other thing that's disappeared in the last 40 years is 40 boatyards. And the Bay Area has lost 40 boatyards in the um, time that Latitude's been published. And many of them needed to go away. They were not very environmentally sound. Um, but also the market diminished, but obviously also development pressure. That condo project is where uh, North Coast Yachts, Tom Wiley used to build boats there. It's now condos, Kettenberg and Marina, and the same thing. They have a big condo project and a plaque that said, Pat, home of Kettenberg Marine, um, where they used to build boats. So we've got a lot of memorial plaques and not a lot of boat building um, left. You know, th there's the boat yards that all went away. So I'm going to also, some quick slides with some statistics. The sailing market, these are courtesy of Sailing World, Cruising World, um, Bonnier Publications, and Sally Helm, who does a lot of work putting this all together for many years. Um, and I really appreciate all the effort, but this is a few stats. And again, I'm going to not go through this, except very quickly to look at that lower right number. Um, uh, brokerage boat sales last year were down, or down about 7%. And I'm going to click right away. Just show you uh, brokerage boat. This the value of boats went up nine percent, and again, this is I think symbolic of the trend towards bigger boats. Um, you know, this is the era that we're in. Is is big boats are selling, small boats are 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 not as um, marketed, and it's harder to make money there. And so this is where the money is. Sailing participation about flat over the last five years. So. Um, you know, we're holding, there has been a big decline, but at least it's holding steady now. So maybe we're at the bottom of, of the uh, curve there, ready to turn up, which is what I'm going to finish up with, all the good reasons that's going to happen. Boat builders, whew, that's decline. And a little up, uptick in boat production in the U.S., uh, but, you know, it's not... Um, you know, uh, it's not really robust in any means, although this brokers will tell you boats are selling and there's a lot of turnover. There's a lot of good energy in the boat market. So that's that's our numbers holding pretty steady in the in the sailing industry uh, for new boat sales, new boat manufacturing in this country. Imports were actually down. You think everything's a Beneteau these days, but imports are down a little bit. Um, but they're they're still the robust, the king of the hill out there. So. Um, all right, back to the positive fun stuff that we do and away from all that other things. I just want to um, talk about all the good things that we like to cover, we want to cover, and uh, the good things that are going on. But uh, opportunity, a lot more offshore racing. California uh, Offshore Race Week got more people uh, heading offshore. We've got the Transpac, Tahiti Transpac happening this year. It happens periodically, but got 10 boats going to race 3,000 miles this coming summer. Um, Baja ha, 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 is holding steady every year, 150 to 180 boats cruising to Mexico, emptying some uh, slips and some full marinas, which is good. And I like this picture to lower right. Uh, there's a lot of young people, we're looking for them, uh, buying old boats. There's tons of great old boats you can get cheap um, that are available and ready to be um, used by anybody. And again, there's a, there's a small boat with lots of people on it, something I like to see. If you're doing the Baja Ha Ha this year, starts in two weeks, you go down to San Diego, you can, can't find a guest slip hardly, uh, especially if you've got a 50 foot boat. San Diego's full, um, Newport Beach is full, Monterey Bay is full, all the slips are full in these uh, places, and mostly sailboats, uh, which is a great thing. And I see that also as a huge opportunity for sailing. It's sort of tough if you're a yacht broker when things start to fill up because it's hard to sell a new boat, but for getting new people into sailing, we have the installed base of vehicles. <laughs> the vessels are there to take everybody sailing. And the key thing is we just need to get them out there and off the docks more often. Um, and so that's happening. And I think there's a lot of good things going on in sailing. Women, for one, you may see St. Francis Yacht Club's uh, first female Commodore there, Teresa Bradner, in the middle of the Maiden picture. I hope everybody's seen the Maiden movie, a uh, spectacular movie, and highlights, again, what's happened since Tracy Edwards sailed around the world in 1989 um, and now continuing with this next voyage. Jen uh, Socrates there, who just finished becoming the oldest person to sail around the world. Uh, Cindy Lou Delmas finishing her first solo single-handed three-bridge fiasco last year. Um, 
and she's taking tons of people sailing all the time. She's a real uh, a cheerleader and booster. I just got back from Annapolis Boat Show. Tons of energy, big boats, lots of big boats, lots of expensive boats, but there were a few nice uh, bigger manufacturers bringing some smaller boats back. But tons of sailors, really fun to be there. If you haven't been to the Annapolis Boat Show, you should probably go. Um, you really feel a great, uh, I always go there because I get excited and engaged. It's just such a, a hub of sailing, beautiful town, um, and really re-energizes you about sailing. Another component, diversity. I mean, there is, uh, you know, America looks different than it did 30, 40 years ago. Sailing starting to, and there's so many great programs that are working hard to help uh, sailing look like more like America. Um, some Treasure Island shots out there. Uh, I know St. Francis done an incredible job supporting uh, the, the Treasure Island sailing programs, but there's terrific activity there, but certainly uh, more needs to be done, and, and that's there's positive opportunities there. And of course, the future's all about youth. There's so many great youth programs. It's uh, TISC out there. There's family sailing, tall ship sailing. That's the San Rafael High School sailing and the lasers there on San Rafael Canal. There is, despite sort of my uh, sense of limiting access or more limited access, there's actually a, a tremendous amount of youth programming. And I got to say, as all these boomers are retiring, a lot of them are saying, all right, I want to give kids what I got when I was a kid. And I think there's a ton of support for youth sailing coming out of the retiring boomer uh, crowd. And it's really, it's really terrific to see. And here's a little piece of that um, that's great stuff going on. Siebel Sailing, Tom Siebel has contributed to U.S. Sailing to get, um, what are they, RS Fivas into youth programs around the country, um, starting here at TISC, Alameda Community Sailing, and Golden Gate Yacht Club. Um, and that's sort of at the community sailing level to get new boats. Community sailing is always financially challenged. So getting new boats uh, donated and obviously they're exciting new fun boats. Um, then we've got um, uh, the Kilroy, who, uh, Kilroy Realty, who's supporting U.S. sailing at the top end, at the pinnacle, um, which is also coming out of St. Francis and San Francisco Bay. These two names and these two members are really terrific with the youth sailing. Um, and that's Caleb Payne there in the fin, our local Olympian sailor. Um, Jack and Charlotte here are St. Francis sailors who just won a race in the NACRA 15 Worlds. Um, so they are um, doing, there's, at the top end of sailing, there's some really stellar performers, as there always have been coming out of the, out of the Bay Area. Another little phenomenon that's going on in sailing that's very positive, if you haven't tuned into YouTube yet and seen these, these two are two very successful YouTube channels, uh, Sailing La Vagabond, Sailing Vessel Delos. Two young couples that have figured out how to not only go cruising, and um, but they're actually making money uh, doing videos. And if you look, there's some uh, statistic sites that help compare their, their hits or their views compared to others. And they, without any marketing budget, just with viral um, marketing, are... Um, getting more hits than the America's Cup or the Volvo Ocean Race and all those people investing tons of money. Uh, these guys are rocking it and there's lots of young people discovering kind of what West Sail the World. This is kind of the modern version of what West Sail the World was breeding in the 70s. And then, of course, community sailing. Look, that's Alameda Community Sailing about to launch out those sailors. Again, I say there's tons of great things going on there. Cal Sailing Club over there in Berkeley. You, know, you can sign up for about a hundred bucks for three months, and you could sail every single day. So that's you know ninety days for a hundred bucks. You know just about a dollar a day you could sail. Um, so that's pretty fantastic. And I think there's a lot of energy putting there. And of course, there's Paul Kayard. You know where would the world be if his dad hadn't sort of put together a little plywood El Toro, and uh, and got him sailing, and think where he's gone since that day. And I think community sailing out of the masses of kids that are going to come out of junior sailing and community sailing, some of them are gonna go on and be the next Paul Kayard and, and probably are already in the Kilroy program now or one of these other higher um, Olympic training programs. Another huge benefit and I think positive thing for sailing is sustainability. And you know, I can say all these things that I'm showing you in slides are things we're paying attention to at Latitude 38 to write about and cover more. You know, the earth is spinning around in space, the solar system, the universe, and you know, we don't have a towboat US, we don't have shore bower to plug the earth into if we get low on our fuel or anything else. And I think sailors know that. 
you know, if you go offshore, Hawaii, go cruising, um, you learn about sustainability. You got a couple of batteries, you got however many gallons of fuel, um, you got a, some water, but you know how to conserve resources, how to live lightly and gently on the planet, on your boat, and I think it would uh, a good sort of poster child for the sustainability we need to think about for the whole planet. So I think, and that's Greta Thunberg sailing into uh, past the Statue of Liberty there. You know, great what she's doing, but I think it's also, oh, is that the hook? No, oh yeah, all right. Um, <laughs> that was it. <laughs> um, but you know, that was also incredible PR for sailing. I mean, how many people saw Greta Thunberg with that uh, sustainability news, but there she was going across the Atlantic on this ripping hot uh, 60 footer foiling, um, tons of great footage, coverage New York Times and CNN and everywhere else, um, great for sailing. In the low tech other uh, end of the, the game there, um, old boats, there are so many old boats. I talked to two people in the last two days who were given boats, one a Wilderness 21 and one a Cal 20. Um, people that, you know, there's nobody that's gonna, you know, they're hard to sell, um, but there's a lot of them languishing around and people love them, but they're not using them. And they're just looking for their next caretaker. Um, and there's young people around that are getting in and getting boats inexpensively, going cruising. Marga there in the uh, lower left with the uh, Peterson 44, uh, a Pearson Trident, a couple of wooden boats. Um, the other thing that's coming along that I think fits well with this is, you know, not every kid wants to be a programmer on their keyboard all day, developing apps or at Google and Facebook. You know, there's STEM training going on in the high schools. There's so much sort of rethinking the loss of shop class and all the other technical skills we've had. The sailing industry itself um, is screaming for new help and technical um, technical people who can come work at their shops. I mean, it's really hard to find the skilled tradesmen. And I think sailing, uh, community sailing and a lot of sailing programs are teaching sailing as a recreational activity. But more and more places are thinking about teaching it as a career, as a career path. And, you know, someday you could grow up to be an ad salesman at Latitude 38 too. I mean, you know, think of the possibilities. Um, but I think uh, working with your hands, not everybody wants to spend their day indoors. And I think the boat yards, and there's a lot of great possibilities um, for getting kids into sailing. Uh, you know, not so many people are crawling around uh, the sailmaker's loft on their hands and knees as the as the a uh, lot of our hot sailors today did when they were in their 20s. But there's lots of opportunity. Um, so just back to sort of the, you know, sailing overall and what we're covering and what's fun, I think, you know, when you survey sailors, why do you sail? It's often freedom and escape. You know, seven million people in the Bay Area here, very few get to experience what we get to do out here in the Bay. And, and so many of them, when they want to escape and get freedom, they drive in three hours, four hours, drive for miles to get away from the crowds of the Bay Area. And we can go 20 feet from this room right here and we'll be escaping. And I think that's the thing we can remember, whether you're that Transpac picture from this year's 100th or rather 50th running of the Transpac with about 100 boats in it, or you're cruising up the Delta like that center picture, doing the Baja Ha Ha. Um, that's Randall Reeves who just sailed back in under the gate last Saturday after 40,000 miles and 305 days at sea, I guess. Um, sailing provides uh, endless pathways to participate. You know, just casually right here in the Bay, we've got Again, one of the most magnificent places to sail right out these windows, um, but also you can take it as far as you want uh, around the world, um, racing, cruising, just recreational sailing. And again, same thing here. Um, I think that's a little Ericsson 27 in the lower left. I mean, what a great escape to the traffic we have ashore here. It doesn't take but a very short drive, unless you're coming from Stockton or Tahoe to uh, take this all in, but most of us live close to here and a lot of people spend a lot of time trying to get away. Um, or of course, the big dreams of cruising to Mexico, Tahiti, racing to Hawaii, they all still have their allure for all of us. And so I gotta tell you my one event, if you've heard about summer solstice, um, I wanna get the whole world sailing on the weekend closest to the summer solstice. Just so happens, ran, I started this 20 years ago, um, and we do it on the Saturday close. It turns out the 20th anniversary, the solstice is on the 20th this year, usually the 21st. It's on a Saturday and it's in 2020. So, uh, and the whole idea is you get yourself on that map and just tell people where and how, why you're going sailing. Because I think too much of the glamour of sailing gets public attention, the foiling boats, the America's Cup, 
whatever else, but, but we want to sort of use this to showcase how most people sail most of the time. And that is what's sort of invisible to the general public. I mean, Greta Thunberg was zooming around there, but um, that's not an approachable way to, for most people to see sailing. And this is an effort to do that. So um, finally, just want to just sort of action plan. I mean, what do we continue to sort of get more people using their boats, participating? Um, you know, number one, I think, is invite families. Think of the, the Kaplans on that Cal 20, that Columbia 22, my family on the Snark. You know, we've got a lot of great junior programming, but what junior programming often doesn't include is the parents. And I think the parents really got to do more family sailing with kids, and we want to invite families on the water because we tell everybody it's a lifelong family activity, and it is for myself and my two daughters. Um, it's a great thing for a lifelong family. You know, events, we do a lot of great racing, but there's family events. Support community sailing. St. Francis is doing that fabulously. The deli business, we need the social activities ashore, like Apre Ski. We want Apre Sail, that people come ashore and have fun. Continue the, building the community. Um, participate in summer sales. Include entry level boats. I mean, we want to make small boats visible. We've got the glitz and glamour all the time uh, visible to the world, but make sure the entry level boats are visible. Welcome the newcomers. Everybody who's sailing around out there with their fenders over the side that we're looking down the nose at, you know, give them a little grace. We all started, yeah, we've all, we've all banged the dock a few times. We want to welcome newcomers uh, and, and be very welcoming to anybody who's challenging the world of sailing. It can be a little daunting. And then, of course, encourage diversity. So we want to just broaden the, and welcome a broader spec, spectrum of people from across the country uh, into sailing. So that's my quick tour of Latitude 38 things we're covering and uh, things we see as uh, challenges, but also opportunity and hope for sailing. So thank you very much. Welcome again to the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon. Our guest today is the publisher of Latitude 38, sailing magazine that started in Sausalito and is now in, still in the Bay Area in Mill Valley, California. Um, John, tell us a little bit about Latitude 38 for those who don't know. How many, uh, how many pages are in it these days? What percent, how many pages of uh, content have percent of advertising? So we're running about a 50-50 split between advertising and editorial. That's kind of our normal normal balance. Uh, you looked at all those charts of sailboat manufacturing. Uh, Latitude has followed a somewhat similar trend as a lot of magazines have. Publishing is, uh, you know, Jeff Bezos is investing, so we take that as a positive sign. But um, but we are um, we are a thinner magazine than we were in the uh, early 2000s. Our fattest issue ever was 306 pages in April 2000. But um, we're in the publishing world, I think, very, very solid. We have great support from our advertisers, great from so support from our readers. Thank you very much, everyone. Um, and, you know, we want to um, continue to cover all the funds out there. So we would love to have the, uh, we, you know, we're, we're feeling very good about where we are and what we're doing. So talk about the staff. I've been to Latitude multiple times. I love it. It's like a neighborhood business in Mill Valley where I come from. But tell me, how, tell us, tell everybody how many staff members you have and what do they do? So we've got um, two ad guys, which I started selling advertising in 1987. I'm still selling it, so I'm counting myself as one of those. Um, and then uh, we've got two production people uh, who are doing all the graphics and design. We've got two editors. Um, and then we have a, a bookkeeper, or part-time bookkeeper, and then another admin who's doing a lot of our digital email and all of our other things that are going along in this modern multimedia world that we're um, trying like many publications to adjust to. Now I'm going to keep asking questions. John, where's the microphone? And we're going to pass. And Paul, if you have a question, go like this. Paul came in. We'll uh, bring the microphone to you. Um, so now I remember um, in the beginnings of Latitude when I would call um, uh, Richard, in like, you know, the second, fourth, eighth, sixth of the month, he was always going off cruising someplace toward two thirds of the way into the month, somewhere like the 17th, 18th, 19th, 20th, he'd be in the office. And then he was like cramming like crazy. I, I was a part of a, a magazine once on the East Coast. And so tell me, when is the genuine closing date? When do you go to the printer every month? I'm not telling that. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. Come on. <laughs> 
<laughs> you know, uh, actually, uh, we are sending the menu right today. Uh, so I am. Uh, I had a scramble this morning with a little ad shuffle in the layout this morning before I came over here. And uh, by tomorrow afternoon, it'll all be at the printer. Unbelievable. So on the 24th, it'll be. Yeah, just right, ab right about this time frame. And uh, we, we have, uh, since sort of Richard's cycle, tried to, uh, we have a smaller staff and we've tried to be more, uh, you know, more plan better ahead, but we still always have a deadline scramble. But Richard, uh, you know, at that time too, for, um, we were, as a monthly magazine, we were prided ourselves in being very newsworthy. Of course, today we don't feel it's that same because the news, everybody knows it, right? You, you um, the news breaks, it's on the internet, so we're trying to add with the magazine more color, more perspective, um, because um, we're not going to tell you who won Big Boat Series with the magazine, but in the year 2000, the year 1995, um, the magazine, that was a critical thing. We would have the news and you'd open the magazine to see what happened. Uh, question from Matt Giannini. Matt. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Hi, yeah. Thanks so much. So I wanted to ask you about boat sharing. It seems to be an enormous opportunity, especially given that so many of these boats out there aren't even being used. I'm wondering about advertiser demand for boat sharing and uh, ad space, obviously, and, and what market penetration is here versus internationally, et cetera. You know, yeah, Thanks. boat sharing, uh, thank you, is a, you know, is a huge opportunity. I do think that's one of, in this app world with Lyft and Uber and everything else, this is being uh, an Airbnb more particularly is the model for boat sharing. Sail time um, is, we've got a base here. They've got 30 or 40 bases worldwide. Um, there was a, a thing called a Freedom Boat Club, which is more power boat oriented, but they've got 200 bases. Um, but I think also boat partnerships, which have always been around, um, make a ton of sense. And with uh, Google Docs and apps, I mean, the ability to share is it's much easier now than all the phone calling and other things that might organize it. I think, um, you know, that's got a huge opportunity to get more people into sailing, a softer entry and, and a little lower commitment. But I think, um, you know, from our from my standpoint, I also think uh, I hope it's the gateway drug because, uh, you know, like renters versus homeowners in communities, people like commitment. And uh, I think an owner of a boat, um, uh, is better than a renter, but at the same time, we love however people, you know, there's much broader spectrum of ways to participate, and I think to find what slot fits you is, is glad it's all there for everybody. How many issues do you print each month? 30,000. And uh, describe how they're distributed. I drive and I drive, I drive. No, um, <laughs> no, um, they're, they're basically distributed in the Bay Area. We have four truck routes. So we do a truck route in Marin, a truck route in the peninsula, and two in the East Bay. Um, and then the rest of the state in Pacific Northwest, we do with uh, FedEx Ground. And so we used to have a route in San Diego. I'd love to find a driver if anybody is listening in San Diego um, and wants to spend a day driving magazines around um, because it's a very easy place to, to tour. Um, but the rest of the coast, you know, it's much more spread out and hard to do a truck route. So those in advertising probably know there's something called a pass-along rate. That is to say, once a magazine's out there, how often does it get rewritten? Do you calculate a pass-along rate for latitude? Well, we have done that. We haven't done that survey in a while. As I remember, the number sort of 2.4, something like that. And I think most magazines, that's in the range. Um, so we do get a nice pass along rate. And, you know, versus the thing we like to talk about versus the digital world, flash gone, you know, the magazine sticks around. And uh, I always imagine people sitting there, you know, come into somebody's living room and they have all the iPads on their coffee table. You know. <laughs> What are they interested in? You know, you walk into their living room and they have a latitude 38 on their coffee table. You go, oh, you sail? You know, it's a real nice longevity. So I was in Bora Bora once and there were latitudes there. And we all know you can go everywhere in Mexico, there's latitudes. And uh, so I think your 2.4 is a reasonable pass along rate. I'd even argue that the age of the magazine seems to hold it very well as well. People seem to keep the magazine around and look for it, especially when they're outside the Bay Area. They seem to look for it. Yeah, no, it's uh, you know that's one of the great things. Of course, we um, and Richard and uh, and the and the people who started the magazine, our early writers, we we created he created a really dedicated following. And I got to say, the early culture of Latitude was a very much a, a family affair. We've been very fortunate to have a lot of ambassadors who will stop by the office and pick up a bundle and say, "I'm going to Puerto Vallarta," or "I'm going to Bora Bora." Take a bundle with them. It's often been rewarded with a beer or something at the other end as you pass them out. So um, you know, we'd love to have people come. Help Help us distribute around the world as well. One of the reasons why, uh, so what's the most read part of Latitude, do you think? 
Well, I, you know, we have surveyed that. Number one has always been letters. letters. Max Ebb is super high. You know, there's a, we have these very uh, nice niches. This is the fun thing about our publication as a general interest. We have our racing section. We have uh, changes in latitudes. But letters, which was, of course, the original social media. Somebody would write. Somebody would write back. We'd answer. There was a lot of uh, dialogue there. And, of course, um, it's amazing how popular, you know, the other thing that shows up a lot in our digital now that we can track is the classifieds. We've got a great classified section, lots of boats in there, and it's amazing how much readership our classifieds get. And, of course, we love seeing that because there's a lot of dreamers out there, and uh, we uh, hope to see them on the bay soon with their new boats. So that's a, that's a very popular section. Uh, Paul Kamen has a question. Paul. Well, I've been doing an informal Farther away, yeah. I've been doing an informal survey among among a demographic pretty much like what's in this room. And I'll ask it here also. How many people in this room had their first date aboard a sailboat? <laughs> aboard a sailboat. First date aboard yeah. a sailboat. I read about that somewhere. <laughs> well, I maintain that one of the failures of our junior programs is that we're not using the kind of boats and we're not setting up the the uh, the programs in a way that allows the teenager to take a boat out with a friend for a sunset cruise outside of the uh, outside of the structure of the organized program and this is partly because we're using high performance boats because we think kids want speed and excitement but most of sailing or at least for most of the world is in light air and a kid who wants speed and excitement isn't going to be attracted to sailing in the first place so i would love to see junior programs return to the type of boat that could be sailed safely unsupervised so that we can have more of those first dates on sailboats because that's what really perpetuates the activity uh, across the generations. And to summarize, it's in the hormones, stupid. <laughs> <laughs> so well, you, go ahead, John. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I would agree too, though. I mean, for me, uh, sailing, again, freedom and escape uh, performance uh, came along at some point. It's fun to go fast, but. Uh, you know, I think that the number one thing for youth sailing is that independence. And I think this is one of the challenges for programs. I mean, programs are programs. I mean, programming is all about programming computers or people or kids, you know, and when you have freedom and think about what sailing means to you, it's kind of escaping programs. Um, so, you know, hopefully programs help create skills, but then hopefully they also give people freedom to kind of explore, um, have dates, be on boats that allow you to have adventures that uh, go beyond the next buoy rounding or uh, the next inside overlap. So I, I'd agree that's, um, you know, had a few dates on boats. That's so now, so you got the, the publication itself with a 30,000 distribution, pass along 2.5, let's call it. So that's like 80,000. Now, what about viewership on electric latitude? How many uh, uniques, how many views? Talk well, about I'm gonna have to, I'd have to pull up my cheat sheet to get this all right, but we're, you know, we've got subscribers, so we'd love you all to subscribe. You can get, you know, put your email address on our website, and you'll get a ping every time we post Electronic Latitude Monday, Wednesday, Friday. So we have 6,000 subscribers to that, um, 6,000 subscribers to our monthly ebook, so you can read the whole magazine digitally online. Which is um, wonderful. Really yeah, well done. Yeah, so we get um, great views of that. So, and then unique daily viewers, we're getting sort of 3,000 to 5,000. You know, obviously you get the great hot story. Um, things <laughs> boost up. I mean, that's the thing with the internet. You think, see things rise and fall um, very quickly when, you, when you've got a, a, a fun story. But um, we've got a lot of um, great unique viewers. And being in Silicon Valley area, we were relatively early after Scuttlebutt. Um, but we had an um, email newsletter started in 2000. And we've been publishing that for just obviously almost 20 years, three times a week. Um, it's, a, it's an enormous amount of time, in fact. Uh, but it's uh, a great archive and a great history of sailing back to 2000 online. What about time on site, average visitor? Golly. That I don't know if I'm going to come up. I, you know, I'm going to say between two and three minutes is the. Uh, I think that's sort of yeah, something okay. like that in that range. Another Here's question. The, Jimmy Dewitt has a question. He can sail. Closer to your. Yes. I'll repeat it. Go ahead. Go ahead. Did you ever see Great Britain fish? I don't do anymore. There it goes. Okay, I have um, a question, Jimmy. Tell him I haven't forgotten a painting I'm going to do of his sig significant other. Ah, okay. So repeat yeah, the I question. Will. Yeah, so uh, Jim DeWitt there was asking uh, if I see Richard Spindler, uh, 
that he hasn't, Jim has not forgotten he's going to do a painting of his significant other, now wife, Donna de Mallorca. Right, and, uh, and I, yeah, yeah, and I will actually see them in two weeks because I'll be in San Diego for the Baja Ha Ha kickoff party. Um, so I'll just I'll have to make a note, and uh, and because I see them, they're getting ready. To, uh, there's all these boats piling into San Diego now, uh, looking for slips. So now all that content, how many contributors do you have? Well, um, not, regular, not counting letters, but other contributors. Yeah, well, regular contributors. John Reese, um, you know, what uh, is still contributing. He's um, doing our changes in latitude section, which was what Richard used to write. Right. Richard was the primary editor for uh, changes in changes in latitude and the letters section and occasional sightings and features. Um, but John Reese, who did that, retired years ago, but now thankfully is uh, doing our changes in latitudes. Um, Andy Turpin. Um, is who was our managing editor retired and sailed off to Tahiti uh, and is in Tahiti now but he is still doing our charter section and in, in contributing electronic latitudes and sightings pieces um, he'll be doing in the issue coming out in a week we'll have a story from Andy in the Tahiti Transpac race uh, which will be happening what next May I think they leave and um, and then we have uh, numerous other contributors. Max Ebb, of course, which still complaint is a complete mystery to all of our readers. You, you, Nobody has know. any idea. So, you but know. he contributes every month for uh, you know I think uh, almost forty years now, maybe forty years. Uh, so well loved and and then um, and then we have a cast of uh, people who do contribute on, on random notes, and we certainly appreciate everybody's contributions. And and always, you know, one of the things we'd love to say, we'd we'd love to hear from people. One thing people do these days is they say, ah, oh, fun story, fun picture, posted on Facebook, done, and they've they've published their news. And I think we'd you know remind people that other people outside of your friend circle, uh, Latitude would love to share that story beyond your own Facebook friend circle, and so send it our way. So speaking of Max Ebb, wouldn't it be interesting to have a book, Max Ebb? Imagine that. What an idea, right? Yeah, no, that would uh, that would definitely <laughs> screw a lot of people up. You know, they would, uh, you know, I, you know, all those intellectual out stories, all those sine waves and formulas and all that. You know, every once in a while, but but everybody be looking for that centerfold of Lee Helm, I think, right? <laughs> right, exactly. Right for the centerfold, exactly. So uh, a couple goes cruising. Give us a model. How much does it cost? What size boat is right? Uh, what's a typical model of a couple, a cruising couple, and/or with or without kids? Well, I, th um, I mean, it, it, like a lot of things, these things are getting bigger these days. Uh, but I think, uh, you know, I think a great size is 40 feet. Uh, myself, I mean, it's you know affordable for more people. Um, it's manageable if you are going with kids. I mean, big boats are fun because you can spread out, but lines get heavy. Kid, the forces get huge. Um, and again, depending on your vision, if you're going, you know, what kind of time you have. Of course, if you want to go around the world and don't have a lot of time, go big. Um, but if you're um, just looking to take time off and go cruising, I think the the 40 foot size is terrific. And of course, when you look at the haha and all the boat, that is the average size in the haha is 40 feet for years now. And um, but there are a lot more bigger, more beautiful boats going. And I think uh, obviously if you have the budget and uh, the ability to use those things, a bigger boat could be much more comfortable. But like Lynn and Larry Pardee, which was another part of the world in 1977, uh, they would say, don't put it off till you've got everything lined up in the money, get a boat and go. And um, 24 feet is what they left in. Um, Webb Childs just returned from sailing around the world on a more 24 by himself. So, um, you know, it, he's done this a few times, six circumnavigations, I think. So I, I'd say the number one thing is um, don't let the uh, boat or the budget slow you down. If you really want to do it, you know, you can make it happen. So give us a model. What kind of a 40-foot boat would a person get? What would somebody spend? And then what's the day's cost, day cost thereafter? Wow. Um, <clears throat> well, that's good. You know, we, we've, we do cover that a lot in Latitude. We find people who cruise for... One dollar, nine dollars a day, very, very inexpensively. You're never in a marina. You know, you're not eating out at restaurants. Obviously, you can go up to the exact opposite end of the world. Um, but I'd say, uh, you know, most people are probably, again, depending on boat sizes. Uh, you know, I, I don't know if I have a good annual budget. I mean, you know, one thing that's getting more tougher is insurance. These hurricanes have uh, caused challenges for the insurance market. So if you um, it's harder to get an older boat and go and have it insured. So you might think about self-insuring um, and, and being very careful. Um, but I'd say, um, you know, twenty thousand dollars probably gets a lot of cruisers through a year if they're um, again depending on haulouts and. And what, what would you pay for the boat to begin with? 
you know, I, I would say, gosh, you know, 60,000 to 150,000, you can probably get yourself a very good sailing boat. Again, depending on your own personal skills, may, you know, maintenance skills, if you're, if you're going to be needing boat yards and other things to fix things up, you're going to want to spend more money on a boat um, and have a bigger budget. But if you've got good handyman skills, um, uh, uh, you can do that. We, I just um, talked to Barry Spanier, who was from the Bay Area, sailed around the, he built a, a ferrocement um, cruising boat in the 70s down by uh, didn't the everybody in part. the 70s yeah <laughs> well he took off and I you know he brought a sewing machine and sailed his way all around the world just fixing other people's sails a lot of people if you have skills can do this kind of thing and he rented a lot down near AT&T Park to build this boat in the 70s for $32 a month I think he said um, <laughs> to, to uh, build this ferro cement boat so you know that's uh, so now you mentioned boat shows um, well first how many boat shows are there now, and how has the boat show market evolved? Well, the show market in general, and I think this goes uh, beyond sailing markets, and, and I think the, also the declines in sailing, too, are beyond sailing. Outdoor activities, a lot has changed in the world. I mean, tennis, golf, and a lot of other outdoor activities have seen similar uh, declines. And boat shows and shows in general, consumer shows, you know, you used to go to them so you could talk to um, – the experts and learn about a water maker, learn about a wind vane, learn about all the gear and equipment. But of course, now you've got YouTube videos, you've got tons of data online. So people don't need, feel like they need shows so much to make a purchase or to understand the product. So shows have declined as a result. And of course, 2008 was a real tough year for so many things, but that's when the sailboat market um, and, and so many others, <laughs> real estate, uh, took a dive. But, but um, there's not the installed base of manufactured new boats. It used to be in the uh, late 90s, early 2000s, sailboat dealers used to have five, six boats in their docks um, to have on display. And you'd put a boat show together, you'd get 50, 60 boats at a boat show. But now dealers do not keep boats in stock. It's much harder to get financing and flooring. The volume's lower. So when you do have a boat show, it's very hard to assemble a real critical mass of boats. And how many boat shows are there in the U.S. these days, and which how off, how many do you go to? Um, I, I don't go to that many more. I go down to San Diego. I go to Annapolis is really the big one. Even Newport, Rhode Island, uh, another huge sailing hub, uh, and I haven't been to it in ages. But that sail that boat show it used to be an all sail show when Pearson yachts and all Bristol and all Hinkley. It used to be loaded with sailboats, and now it had very few sailboats, almost all power boats. That, that center console outboard power boat is the, is the rock and market in the boating world now. Um, and, you know, and I think that's more of an East Coast thing. Sailing is, because uh, California is such an awesome place to sail, but what it doesn't have is a lot of islands and a places to go. And the East Coast, you know, you can jump in an outboard center console boat and zip out to a picnic beach. You know, we don't do that so much here. And so that's why sailing, I think, is much more prevalent in California. But um, for boat shows, where you, I mean, Chicago boat show, I used to go regularly, Miami. Um, but there are just a lot less sailboats um, to see in any of these places. So if you're going to go to one and you were shopping for a boat, Annapolis is the place to go. So the Johnson brothers have done an amazing job with J-boats. Yeah. Do they make the most racing boats, period? Who else makes more racing boats? Uh, well, they would they would be the volume winner by far. Um, I mean, they, they definitely, uh, you know, Melgis has done a tremendous job with other classes. But that era of, of lots of race boats, I mean, you think if I show you all those sailing numbers and what's going on in sailing, um, you know, the racing market is very small. Even putting Latitude 38 together, uh, uh, there's not as many ads for racing. You, you uh, see how many things that we do um, covering sailing. Racing takes a lot of coverage. There's a lot of activity. It's a really um, energized section of the sport, but it's... 10% of sailing. Um, you know, there's 3 million um, sailors out there in the world now. U.S. sailing has 45,000 members. So, you know, the scale of racing is pretty small compared to cruising. Although, again, if you've got Thistles, Flying Scots, Rhodes 19, Day Sailors, and numerous other great one design classes are happening in lakes, ponds, uh, you know, up here in the Hunting Lake. Mercuries, you know, they're still rocking like terrifically thanks to people like Pax there um, so there's so many great old classes that are um, still capturing everybody to get them out on the water so the founder and president of the sailing science center has a question Jim Hancock uh -oh. question. sailing and science this could be tricky yeah hi John um, sailing is such a great way for people to learn about 
things like STEM education and even personal growth leadership. But there's a perception that sailing is just for rich white people. What do we do to deal with that, what I think is a misperception because there's so many opportunities for, for young, even underserved people to sail and benefit from it? Yeah, well, and I, and I do think that is a misperception. That's sort of what some of my slides are addressing. You know, sailing, uh, the business imperative is, imperative is that we do need to make money. A lot of what we present is the product and the things that we do as an industry to make money. Um, but all there are this huge installed base of little boats. There's great community sailing programs. You know, we do need to have more people that don't look like me, though, sitting up here with a microphone telling that story probably. Um, you know, we need to put diversity up front. Um, and I also think, uh, you know, again, this world, the, the flash zip of carbon foiling and so many technical things that are awesome about sailing do miss the uh, the romance of sailing, as, as Paul described. I mean, you think about who sailors are. There's a lot of engineers. There's a lot of pilots, a lot of technical people, tinkerers um, who love to fix boats. But it's also um, the poets and the artists and the minstrels that get out there and sail. And I think that's the thing that is harder to promote. It's less organized, and it's harder to make visible. And I think um, sort of to welcome that broader community in, um, we've got to sort of downplay some of the racing components and and bring up the, the, the romance and the recreation that sailing offers. And of course, include in our pictures and our media um, a better image of the cross section of sailors that exist. But of course, I think it was Alistair Murray that said, you know, the typical sailor is male, pale, and stale. You know? <laughs> um, and, uh, and I'm not going to convince <laughs> anyone that it's otherwise, because here I am. <laughs> uh, but, but we do need to, uh, you know, I mean, this is something we're trying to do at Latitude, really, is get more younger people in there. A lot of our Baja Haha people are retired people, um, but there are more young people going along um, in these community programs and in these slides. You know, when we can have in the magazine more picture of what's actually going on, the commercial sailing schools, OCSC, Club Nautique, Modern, they say about 50% of their students are now um, women. I mean, that's a big change from 20 years ago. I mean, it's really 50-50. That's the first thing that I think sailing when it thought of diversity, that, uh, you know, get women out of the galley and at the helm. And that's really, obviously, with Maiden, made huge strides. But there's many more layers that are, um, I think, tons of people working on it. Pegasus out of Berkeley is taking numerous, numerous kids. They've got a, a motto of, you know, no child left ashore. Um, Wonderful. And I, I think, you know, there's a great, there's so many great programs underway that I think we just want to try and help make it visible and so that others see it. What about the carbon footprint of a 30-foot sailboat versus a 30-foot powerboat? Do we know anything about that? No comparison. You know, my Ranger 33 I, I has a 15-gallon gas tank I fill it maybe once a year because um, I have a very short commute to the bay luckily but uh, I think um, you know this is the crazy thing these these uh, power boats that have twin 350s on the transom and they'll burn 40 to 60 gallons an hour um, you know the big whalers will burn 80 to 100 an hour um, sailing you know especially in San Francisco Bay of course is um, you hardly have to use your engine it's not as true if you're in the Chesapeake or maybe Pacific Northwest, um, so that can be somewhat regionalized. But um, I think despite the fact that sailboats are made of plastic, have the plastic sails, plastic lines, and we're all wearing our polyester plastic clothes, um, but, you know, <laughs> it all pretty much lasts forever. So there's a lot of sustainability in there, and, of course, um, brokers sort of curse that because all those boats built in the 70s are still here, but that's a good thing. Um, we all, we as sailors recognize that STEM education um, without a book is happening every time you go sailing. You learn all about physics without opening a book, all about geometry, trigonometry, the weather without opening a book. But that message really hasn't gotten out very much. I used to hear when I was a young guy that essentially the highest GPA in collegiate athletics were the sailors, better than golf and basketball and so on, because you know, it does take some brain power to make a sailboat go. You don't just turn on the gas and step on the gas. So are you passing that message out there as well? Um, certainly we do. I think the Sailing and Science Center, TISC, uh, most of these junior programs are definitely the STEM trade, and U.S. Sailing is doing it. They've got the textbooks. And in fact, um, Kurt Holland, who's been working with a California 
uh, education board has got um, STEM training now and, and sailboat training approved to get into youth programming as part of elementary school or fifth, sixth grade classes. So actually California um, educational standards have actually embraced this. It'll take a while till it appears at your dock side, I think, but, but there's definitely a recognition that um, we got too test oriented and less craft oriented and science oriented and so I think um, you know th that may have been true at a lot of colleges I'm not sure I upheld that standard at UVM is that highest GPA but, um, <laughs> you were a captain but, uh, of the sailing you know, team we should expect that from you <laughs> well that sailing team was you know a case of beer in a van and we go off sailing but, um, uh, but uh, I think uh, you know clearly uh, all the things that this is why I think sailing is and why I think most of us are so passionate about it obviously it's a ton of fun but you know, working a sailboat through the water, watching the currents on the bay uh, is one of the most fun and challenging places to sail. Obviously, go offshore, you see the stars, you get navigation, what the Polynesians learned thousands of years ago. Um, you know, none of this is textbook necessary, and most sailors, um, probably till Stuart Walker came along, uh, you know, everybody sort of just felt it in their bones and in their hearts what was going to move uh, them into first place or across an ocean. But... Uh, what you learn sailing and, and not only about, um, I think, sustainability in relationship to the earth, to nature, to your friends, but also intellectually as far as the engineering uh, and the science and how, how the world works um, is just embedded into the, the process of learning to sail. And it can sound intimidating when you look at angles and charts and graphs and all the numbers, but when you get it a helm, it, it comes a lot more naturally than most people realize. Well, on behalf of our underwriters, um, Dick Diatley, uh, the wonderful late Dick Diatley, and the San Francisco Sailing Foundation, uh, John, we want to thank you very much for coming to the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon and sharing your story about Latitude 38 with us. And with that, the luncheon is adjourned. Thank you, Ross. Thanks, Mr.